uh, housing affordability, making ends meet in the ACT. It's hosted by the ANU Students Association and the Australian Fabians, uh, two organisations who have worked consistently over the years on, issue, on social justice issues, on affordability uh, for low income earners um, and, and who actively push those issues today. The ANU Students Association has been at this university since, since 1960 and you only have to go through the records to see that this issue is one that never goes away, an issue which is always in the forefront of students' minds, an issue which is dealt with better and worse depending on who the Vice-Chancellor is and who the government is of the day. Even though the Labor Party has the strongest history of investing in public housing in Australia. The accommodation we have here at ANU was built by the Menzies and Holt governments. Uh, and um, the Australian Fabians have been pushing social justice issues for, for decades, in fact centuries, um, if, you, if you take it right back. The Fabians are an organisation uh, dedicated to parliamentary democracy, to debate, to dialogue of ideas um, and an organisation which has quietly contributed to policy making, thought and dialogue in Australia uh, for, for decades and we're um, honoured to have them co-host our event today. But this event is not about them. This is an event um, organised so that the students of the university can hear from the minister responsible for the problem they care about most, sorry, not for the problem, for the issue. Um, Tanya Plibersek, um, the member for Sydney, needs a uh, little introduction to most students, given that many ANU students come from Sydney, um, she's familiar to most of them. She's been a member of parliament since 1998, representing uh, the federal electorate of Sydney. She's been the Minister for Women and the Minister for Housing since 2007 um, and the election of the Rudd government. And since that time, uh, the government has invested um, in over 21,000 new public housing dwellings, many of which were part of the recent stimulus package has developed a new strategy on homelessness uh, and has invested billions in the new National Rental Affordability Scheme. Uh, I won't say anything more other than to say that the Minister was quoted in the press recently as saying that had uh, the last government invested um, as much in public housing as the previous government had, i.e. kept the same funding level in 1996, we wouldn't be in the situation we are now where there's such an acute housing crisis uh, and that's a crisis that has been felt by ANU students um, this year and no doubt one which will continue next year. So without any further introduction from me, I'd like to uh, extend a very warm welcome to the Minister for Housing um, and uh, Member for Sydney, the Honourable Tanya Plibersek. Uh, thank you, Tully. I also want to start by acknowledging that we're meeting on the land of the Ngunnawal people and pay my respects to their elders. Um, it always makes a, uh, a minister a little nervous to be told they're on YouTube somewhere, but I guess, <laughs> I, I guess knowing that it's being filmed gives me some protection in that respect. It's um, terrific to be at a Fabian Society event because the Labor Party and the Fabian Society go a long way back and we've always valued the role of the Fabians as a critical friend of the Labor Party, contributing to our policy development processes. The Fabian Society in Australia began in 1947 at a time when Labor was in power, when Ben Chifley was Prime Minister and uh, I think probably every Fabian knows the famous light on the hills uh, quote from Chifley, I think of the Labor movement not as putting an extra sixpence into somebody's pocket or making somebody Prime Minister or Premier, but as a movement bringing something better to the people, better standards of living, greater happiness to the mass of the people. We have a great objective, the light on the hill, which we aim to reach by working for the betterment of mankind, not only here but anywhere we may give a helping hand. If it were not for that, the Labor movement would not be worth fighting for. At that time, just after the Second World War, about 53% of Australians owned a home of their own or were buying it. 14 years later, in 1961, the rate of home ownership had reached 70%. Very quick movement from after the Second World War um, into home ownership. But home ownership rates pretty much stopped at 70% and 50 years later that rate remains largely unchanged. 
What the figures don't show though is how much harder it is for young people trying to get into the housing market. When land was cheap once upon a time and it was construction costs that made up most of the cost of buying a new home, land supply is now scarce and um, commensurately land is expensive. The impact on young Australians who are interested in buying a home of their own has been very significant. It's housing affordability now that shapes the typical housing cycle or housing career, as some people call it, of most Australians. In the normal course of events, people move through the housing cycle in a way that matches the stages of life that they're at. So they move out of the family home in their late teens or early 20s as they gain independence from their families, they rent, they save for a home either in their own or as part of a couple or a group, they buy a home they can afford and maybe they upgrade when they have a family. In their middle age they are more than likely to have paid off their mortgage and that means that they have housing security in their old age. That's no longer the typical housing cycle for Australians. Young people generally live at home much longer than they once did. They generally rent for longer and they're more likely to be um, saddled with a mortgage, not just into their middle age, but more often than not into retirement as well. In fact, in 2006, nearly 65,000 retiree households were still paying off the mortgage. Affordable rent is also elusive right around Australia. We have very low rental vacancy rates. We see high turnover as landlords want to maximise their profits in a tight market and we see um, less uh, long-term or lifelong rental uh, as we see in other, in other countries and other economies. Throughout the world, shelter is recognised as a basic human right and a critical component of individual wellbeing and a ticket out of poverty. And as a government, we feel very strongly that Australians also have access to that right, should have access to that right. And we have invested an enormous amount in pursuing that for Australians, $20 billion in housing programs since we came to government. Toby Hall, the Chief Executive of Mission Australia said, I don't think there's any question the federal government is committed to tackling the problem. The Rudd government is the first administration that's shown the courage to tackle an issue that's remained untouched for decades. Recently, I released the State of Supply report and that State of Supply report showed that, um, well, if we needed any further proof, that housing supply is simply not coming up with, keeping up with demand. We established the Housing Supply Council on coming into government, so this is the second state of supply report that we've, um, we've had from the Housing Supply Council. And I guess um, the, the fundamental change between the previous administration and ours is that the uh, idea that the Commonwealth actually has a role in this. The previous government um, didn't collect any figures uh, about housing shortages or housing supply. Uh, when asked about housing supply or housing affordability, they'd always just say this is the responsibility of the states. But the Housing Supply Council most recent report found that the demand for housing began to exceed housing starts at least 10 years ago and that the problem has been exacerbated every year since. The result is that in June 2009, Australia was 178,400 homes short of meeting underlying demand. Compounding this frightening shortage was the fact that within a year of taking office, uh, we faced the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Housing was a critical part of our response to the global financial crisis, first through the first homeowners boost and secondly through an historic investment in new social housing. The first time owners boost immediately um, restored enough confidence in the housing market to continue construction at, the, at more or less the rates that had been going and the boost helped almost a quarter of a million Australians into a home of their own. The proportion of first home buyers in the market peaked at 28.5% in May 2009 and that came from lows as low as 16% in earlier years. So the, the effect on first home buyers was very substantial. 
Yet even before the first homeowners boost, we were aiming to support uh, young Australians into buying a home of their own through the first homeowners, uh, first home saver accounts. Um, first home saver accounts are, are a, a much um, longer term way of helping people into a home of their own. As house prices were increasing, we knew that the um, deposit gap, as it's known, was a critical problem for people wanting to enter the housing market. When you're paying very high rents, it's very hard to save a deposit for a home of your own. So with first home saver accounts, we said that for uh, every dollar you put into one of these accounts, up to $5,000 a year, the government will put 17 cents in. So if you put in five, the maximum $5,000 a year, the government puts in an $850 co-contribution and they're taxed at the same low rate as superannuation. Our, our desire, our, our focus um, before the global financial crisis was to help young people um, save a deposit for their home over time so that we didn't have an inflationary effect of, uh, of um, um, uh, you know, flooding the market too quickly. Obviously the global financial crisis, the priorities changed and we needed to keep people, keep the industry building and keep housing supplies strong. Um, we've made some changes to first home saver accounts in the recent budget and uh, we still think that it's very important, particularly now that the global financial crisis has um, uh, changed its characteristics here in Australia and that the housing market has, ch has changed its characteristics compared with other housing markets around the world. It's important to help people into the housing market uh, through this um, measured savings plan. Also under the stimulus package, um, we thought it very important to um, use the opportunity, we, we knew we needed to invest in building infrastructure. We did that through the Building the Education Revolution, through uh, unprecedented investments in urban infrastructure, uh, new railway lines, new roads, new port facilities, but it was an historic opportunity to invest in social housing and we've done that with a $5.6 billion investment in social housing that um, not only kept the building industry strong at a critical period, but has a um, decades-long impact on providing more affordable accommodation for some of Australia's most vulnerable people. That translates to nearly 20,000 new homes and repairs on more than 70,000 other properties right around the country. Um, I visit a lot of building sites, I visit a lot of public housing that's being repaired through this program and a lot of it had not had major work done to it since it was built in the 40s and the 50s, you know, maybe a bit of re repair every now and again. But the major refurbishments that were making things that were built in the 50, 40s, mostly 50s, 60s, sometimes 70s, making them fit for purpose now, putting in simple things like um, grab rails and kitchens that could be converted so that someone with mobility problems can use them more easily. They really are quite life-changing um, things to do for the people who are living in those properties. Um, there's more than 2,000 individual social housing projects right around the country building these almost 20,000 new homes. 14,200 of those homes are under construction right now. They're being built right now. It's a massive program of building. 1,400 of those homes are complete. Many of them have families moving in, including here in the ACT where I've um, visited a number of families who've moved into the first properties. In the ACT, we're spending $76 million to build over 380 new homes and $6 million to repair 205 others. And the repairs, I've got to say, are very significant as well. You only need to look at the age of some of the public housing in Canberra to know how much in need of upgrading a lot of it was. Um, the other really important aspect of our social housing stimulus package is it helps us meet our um, target of halving overall homelessness by 2020. Australia still on an, on an average night, on the last census night, had 105,000 Australians who are homeless. Um, 16,000 of those were sleeping rough. 
Uh, we count in Australia, slightly unusually compared with other countries, we count people in marginal housing as homeless as well. So if you're in boarding house or caravan or staying with friends, you, you picked up in the homelessness figures. But 16,000 people sleeping rough. Um, in the ACT, there were, on uh, the last census night, 1,364 people who were homeless, with 78 of those sleeping rough. And that rate, compared with many other parts of Australia, is low, but I don't think we should accept for a moment that it's low enough. 60% uh, of ACT's homeless population are under the age of 25, compared with just around 45% in the rest of the country. So that you see the profile of homeless Canberrans is much younger than the profile of homeless people generally around the country. It also includes 296 children who were under the age of 12, or 22% of the homeless population of Canberra under the age of 12. Most of those would be children who are homeless, usually with their mother, escaping domestic violence, in some circumstances with both parents or, or just with a father. Um, it, it, but any way you look at it, uh, absolutely unacceptable. In the ACT, the Commonwealth and Territory Governments are working together to invest more than $20 million to address homelessness through our National Partnership Agreement on Homelessness. There's um, another building program called A Place to Call Home that's specifically targeted at providing homes for homeless people. In the ACT, that program will deliver 20 homes for homeless families. Earlier this month, my colleague Kate Lundy and ACT Minister for Housing Joy Birch opened the first of these new homes for a mother and her three children in Dunlop. In March, we launched, also launched the ACT's Street to Home program. Under this program, St Vincent de Paul will receive a million dollars to assist homeless Canberrans re-engage with support services, which will help them keep a roof over their heads. The critical thing about Street to Home programs, which we're uh, pushing in all of the states and territories, is that um, many homeless people, uh, often for reasons of mental illness, um, don't approach homelessness services. Um, they're anxious about it, they're suspicious of them. Street to Home initiatives are designed uh, to have um, teams of often multidisciplinary teams go out and engage with homeless people where they are um, and build trust with them and say, we have a place, if you come with me, we have a place for you. There is somewhere we can take you where you can have shelter and security. And, um, and that's a, it's going to be a critical component of us meeting our white paper uh, targets over time. People uh, experiencing chronic homelessness, particularly rough sleepers and at-risk young people, will be targeted by the program, which works to address mental health, drug and alcohol issues. We're also um, spending uh, uh, $2 million to build a new facility called Home in Queanbeyan, um, not too far from here, to develop 20 self-contained units for people with chronic mental illness who can't live independently um, or have been homeless. We're building another 40 facilities right around the country, specialist homelessness services on top of the public housing and the other investment through a place to call home and the National Partnership on Social Housing. Um, but that those extra 40 services will provide 1,600 new homes for people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Critically, these ones are linked to support services. Um, there are some people who are homeless who need a house or a flat, and once they've got a house and a flat, they're going to be fine. There are other people who have cycled through homelessness services many, many times. They've got underlying issues that make their lives chaotic. It, it might be mental illness, it might be drug and alcohol abuse, it may be a range of other issues, who actually, if you put them in uh, an ordinary you know, public housing or private dwelling are more than likely to fail in that tenancy for one reason or another. So we need to have specialist services, specialist facilities with services attached to help people maintain their tenancies as well. And I'm absolutely delighted that many of these facilities are 
uh, innovative new approaches based on the common ground model in New York, based on the FOIA models in Europe. We have these facilities around the country already, not enough of them, and actually building um, building these new places over the next few years will be, make a big difference to our rough sleeping population. We're also targeting people in the private rental market. The private rental market has been a really tough place for a really long time. Um, I was mentioning earlier low rental vacancy rates and what that does to rental costs. Um, there is no solution other than adding to stock. People talk about the different ways of subsidising private rental all the time. Uh, they're, they're very interesting to look at, but we will not improve rental affordability unless we have enough homes for people to rent. So we've committed, um, over the next four years, we'll spend about a billion dollars on a new program called the National Rental Affordability Scheme. It's a program we introduced when we came into government. And basically, it, um, it, it uh, subsidises the building of new affordable rental properties that are rented out then at 20% below the market rate for that area. We've done it in this way because we know we need to add to stock. We know that we're not building enough homes to buy or homes to rent. And so this program is um, aimed at squarely at seeing more rental properties built and then the, uh, the um, uh, you know, benefit from our perspective as a government is in the increase in supply but also the reduced rent that tenants are paying. Uh, we expect to see 50,000 of these properties built um, over the next few years and uh, the, there's a few things that I think are particularly interesting about this program. Um, the first is it's not a replacement for public housing. This is about more affordable rental but we're targeting a much broader income group than people on, on social security benefits. Because of the disinvestment over the time of the Howard government in particular in public housing, public housing became very tightly targeted and you basically had to be on a social security income to, um, to be eligible for public housing. The National Rental Affordability Scheme is not like that. It's for low and middle income earners. It includes key workers. Um, and it does that very particularly for two reasons. First of all, because a lot of the people who are under rental stress are in that group. They're earning, uh, they're earning a wage, but it's a relatively low wage and high costs of rent mean that it's uh, pretty hard for them to afford the private rental market. And secondly, that we think that um, the increased concentrations of many people uh, sometimes with multiple disadvantages in one unit block or one suburb um, hasn't always been the best social outcome for those people. So we want the National Rental Affordability Scheme to have a, a range of uh, a range of income groups, you know, police, nurses, teachers, students, uh, able to rent and. Uh, with the savings, it's my mum always rings right around now. <laughs> You'd think she'd know. Um, the so far in the ACT, uh, there've been 157 incentives allocated under the first two rounds of the scheme. Round three is open at the moment, and I expect that there will be um, some substantial uh, new applications in round three. Um, it's open till the end of August. But just to give you some idea, in the first two rounds, we've approved 11,000 incentives. So far in round three, we've had eight applications for over 12,000 incentives. So um, if even half of them get up, we're looking at 20,000 extra homes uh, rental homes around Australia on top of what we're building in social housing and over time certainly the whole of these 50,000 incentives will be used. One of the things that we've said about NRAS properties is we want them to be well located, we want them to be environmentally sustainable, we want them to be good quality housing. It's not about building shoddy stuff, it's about building good quality um, rental housing that is covered by all of the relevant uh, tenancy laws in a particular state and territory. In um, the ACT, we've built 22 in the new suburb of Crace. Um, they've been funded through the National Rental Affordability Scheme. A further 24 are in Holt, and um, John Stanhope and I opened them in February. They are, they're modern homes, they're well built, they minimise energy and water use, they're designed to last. and. 
the um, the reason that we have focused uh, on the sustainability of the homes is because we see that um, this is a it's a it's critical to our environmental outcomes in the future. It's critical to the household bills, the utility bills of the people who'll be living in them, and um, and we also want to, uh, I suppose. Um, push the market a little bit on making some of these uh, inclusions that we've expected in our social housing and NRAS to become much more standard. Our social housing, for example, is six star energy efficient, which is better than the standard in almost every state and territory. But it's meant that a lot of private developers or builders who are building to this standard and to the adaptability standards that we've insisted on are actually doing it for the first time and thinking, oh, this isn't so complicated. I could do this in the buildings that I'm building for the market, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't add so much to our costs or difficulties. The final thing that I want to say to you is um, it's not just about the, the number of homes we're building, it's also about the type of homes we're building. I've spoken to you just uh, briefly about sustainability, location, all of that sort of thing. But there's one big demographic change that's heading down the road towards us over the, the next years and decades, and that's the huge growth in single person households that we're likely to see in Australia. And we know that um, uh, we know that that's coming based on demographic trends. Um, we also, as a government, think it's quite important to have a range of housing products being built. Um, not everyone wants a four bedroom home on a big block of land on the edge of the city. Some people do. Um, so maybe a great idea when you've got, you know, three young kids running around and you want to be able to send them out to the backyard. Um, but it's not right for everyone and increasingly we've got more single people uh, in our housing market and we're not building for them. The status supply report says that demand for smaller homes will increase in marked contrast to what we've been building in recent years. In the 30 years to 2006, the average number of people per household fell from 3.1 to 2.6. Yet over the same period, the proportion of houses with four or more bedrooms increased by 11%. The challenge to business and to urban planners, um, and I've got to say to local government in some respects, uh, is to address these mismatches through quality building and urban design. And in the case of local government, not being wedded, um, as many of them are, to the 700 square metre block of land. Clearly, if we are to achieve our dream of making home ownership uh, uh, affordable, um, uh, of making uh, rental accommodation affordable and of halving homelessness, we still have an enormous task before us. Um, my treasurer, Wayne Swan, said in his book Postcode, we need to renew our commitment to housing policy to address growing polarisation of incomes and opportunity in our community. Good housing policy is an antidote to poverty and inequality, and I absolutely think he's right. That's why we also need to increase housing supply as a priority. It's why the left needs to support an increase in housing supply also. We can't hope to address the polarisation of opportunity in our community if we don't get our housing policy settings right. And even with our new historic investment in homelessness and in social housing, we won't meet all of the future needs for housing through those investments. And we need to remember that most Australians still want to choose the place they rent or choose the place they buy. Without increased housing supply, home ownership and affordable rental are impossible goals. And I believe that it's our responsibility as a government to work on meeting those needs. Thanks.